Where's one of the places that you wish to go to? Ever wanted to go to Tokyo? Take a look at these images. Tokyo is one of the most densely packed cities in the world. It's also technologically very advanced, full of loads of entertainment and lots of sights to see. I have to say that I've never particularly dreamed of Tokyo for its sights, but I certainly love Japanese food and I enjoy the culture to some degree. We're going to learn a little bit about it today in this story by Fumiko Hayashi. She was one of Japan's most popular and acclaimed female writers. Uh, she only lived till 1951. Her first novel is called The Journal of a Vagabond. It was published in 1927. Uh, it's about the time that the setting for F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby occurred. She published 270 books, fiction, nonfiction, and poems. Hayashi became familiar with life on the Tokyo streets from holding a variety of menial jobs that left her homeless. Drawing on her own experience, Hayashi began writing stories about the poor yet hardworking people on the fringe of society. If you haven't thought about theme, I encourage you to do so. Theme is this powerful, extraordinarily elusive thing that we encourage you all to think about. Theme is not the moral to a story. But, and nor is it just a mere topic, not like death or homelessness, but what the author seems to be saying by all the different ways they characterize people and the way they integrate mood and tone and setting into a story, the conflicts that they allow to play out in their stories, that teach us something about human behavior. What's good in us, what's bad in us, what creates goodness and badness in us, what makes us work together, love each other, to be loyal or not loyal. Consider what the theme is and how you are going to determine this as you read. Make sure you're using the graphic organizers provided in your lessons to improve your note taking. I encourage you to draw those out in notebook paper or create your own Word or publishing document of them or just handwrite notes that are of the same form. Let's begin the actual reading of Tokyo. It was a bitter windy afternoon. As Ryo hurried down the street with her rucksack, she kept to the side where the pale sun shone down over the roofs of the office buildings. Every now and then she looked about curiously at a building, at a parked car, at one of those innumerable bomb sites scattered throughout downtown Tokyo. Glancing over a boarding, Ryo saw a huge pile of rusty iron, and next to it a cabin with a glass door. A fire was burning within and the warm sound of the crackling wood reached where she was standing. In front of the cabin stood a man in overalls with a red kerchief around his head. There was something pleasant about this tall fellow, and Rio screwed up her courage to call out, Tea for sale. Would you like some tea, please? Tea, the man, said the man. Tea, said Rio with a nervous smile. It's Shuzoko tea. She stepped in through an opening in the boarding and unfastened the straps of her rucksack, put it down by the cabin. Inside, she could see a fire burning in an iron stove. Bomb sites um, is referring to the bombings from World War II, and the tea actually comes from another region in Japan, so it would have been specialized. From a bar uh, above hung a brass kettle with a wisp of tea rising, wisp of steam rising from the spout. Excuse me, said Rio. Would you mind if I came in and warm myself by your stove a few minutes? It's freezing out, and I've been walking for miles. Of course you can come in, said the man. Close the door and get warm. He pointed towards the stool, which was his only article of furniture, and sat down on a packing case in the corner. Rio hesitated a moment. Then she dragged her rucksack into the cabin, and crouching by the stove, held up her hands to the fire. You'll be more comfortable on that stool, said the man, glancing at her attractive face, flushed in the sudden warmth, and at her shabby attire. Shabby meaning she's not well dressed, it's holy and probably unclean. Surely this isn't what you usually do, hawk tea from door to door? Oh, yes, it's how I make my living, Rio said. I was told that this was a good neighborhood, but I've been walking around here since early morning and I've only managed to sell one packet of tea. I'm about ready to go home now, but I thought I'd have my lunch somewhere on the way. Well, you're perfectly welcome to stay here and eat your lunch, said the man. 
and don't worry about not having sold your tea, he added, smiling. It's all a matter of luck, you know. You'll probably have a good day tomorrow. The kettle came to a boil with a whistling sound. As he unhooked it from the bar, Rio had a chance to look about her. She took in the boarded ceiling black with suit, the blackboard by the window, the shelf for family gods on which stood a potted sakaki tree. The man took a limp-looking packet from the table and, unwrapping it, disclosed a piece of cod. A few minutes later, the smell of baking fish permeated the cabin. Come on, said the man. Sit down and have your meal. Rio took her lunch box out of the rucksack and seated herself on the stool. Selling things is never much fun, is it? remarked the man turning the cod over on the grill. Tell me, how much do you get for a hundred grams of tea? I should get 35 yen to make any sort of profit. The people who send me the stuff often mix in bad tea, so I'm lucky if I can get 30 yen. In Riel's lunchbox were two small fish covered with some boiled barley and a few bean paste pickles. She began eating. Where do you live? the man asked her. In Chitaya district. Actually, I don't know one part of Tokyo from another. I've only been here for a few weeks, and a friend's putting me up until I find something better. The cod was ready now. He cut it in two and gave Rio half, adding potatoes and rice from a platter. Rio smiled and bowed slightly in thanks, and then took out a bag of tea from her rucksack and poured some into a paper handkerchief. Do put this into the kettle, she said, holding it out to him. He shook his head and smiled, showing his white teeth. Good Lord, no, it's far too expensive. Quickly, Rio removed the lid and poured the tea in before he could stop her. Laughing, the man went to get, fetch a teacup and a mug from the shelf. What about your husband, he asked, while ranging them on the packing case. You're married, aren't you? Oh, yes, I am. My husband's still in Siberia. That's why I have to work like this. Rio's thoughts flew to her husband, whom she had not heard for six years. By now he had come to seem so remote that it required an effort to remember his looks or the once familiar sound of his voice. She woke up each morning with a feeling of emptiness and desolation. At times it seemed to Rio that her husband had a frozen had frozen into a ghost in that subarctic Siberia. Now note this, he's not even in Japan. Siberia is part of the former Soviet Union and war prisoners were held there. A ghost, or a thin white pillar, or just a breath of frosty air. Nowadays, no one any longer mentioned the war, and she was almost embarrassed to let people know her husband was still a prisoner. It's funny, the man said. The fact is, I was in Siberia myself. I spent three years chopping wood near the Amur River. I only managed to get sent home last year. But it's all in a matter of luck. It's tough on your husband, but it's just as tough on you. So you've been pre-patriated from Siberia? You don't seem any the worse for it, Rio said. That means he got sent back to his home country. Well, I don't know about that, the man shrugged his shoulders. Anyway, as you see, I'm still alive. Rio closed her lunchbox, and as she did so, she studied him. There was a simplicity and directness about this man that made her want to talk openly in a way she found difficult with more educated people. Got any kids yet, he said. Yes, a boy of six. He should be at school, but I've had difficulty getting him registered here in Tokyo. These officials certainly know how to make life complicated for people. The man untied his kerchief, <clears throat> wiped the cup and the mug with it, and poured out the steaming tea. It's good stuff, this, he said, sipping noisily. Do you like it? It's not the best quality, you know, only 210 yen a kilo wholesale, but you're right, it's quite good. The wind had grown stronger while they were talking. It whistled over the tin roof of the cabin. Rio glanced out of the window, stealing herself for her long walk home. I'll have some of your tea, 750 grams, the man told her, extracting two crumbled hundred yen notes from the pocket of his overalls. Don't be silly, said Rio, you can have it for nothing. Oh, that won't do. Business is business. He forced the money into her hand. Well, if you're ever in this part of the world again, come in and have another chat. I should like to, said Rio, glancing around the tiny cabin. But you don't live here, do you? Oh, but I do. I look after that iron out there and help load the trucks. I'm here most of the day. He opened a door under the shelf, disclosing a sort of cubbyhole containing a bed, neatly made up. Rio noticed a colored postcard of the fifty bells of Yamada tacked to the back of the door. 
My, you fixed it up nicely, she said. You're really quite snug here, aren't you? She wondered how old he could be. Two. From that day on, Rio came regularly to the Yatsugi district to sell tea, each time she visited the cabin on the bomb site. She learned that the man's name was Tsuriyoshi Yoshio, almost invariably. He had some small delicacy waiting for her to put in her lunchbox, a pickled plum, a piece of beef, a sardine. Her business began to improve, and she acquired a few regular customers in the neighborhood. A week after their first meeting, she brought along her boy, Ryukiki. Tsurushi chatted with the child for a while, and then took him out for a walk. When they returned, Ryukichi was carrying a small, a large caramel cake. He's got a good appetite, this youngster of yours, said to Tsuruyoishi, patting the boy's closed, cropped head. Ryo wondered vaguely whether her new friend was married. In fact, she found herself wondering about various aspects of his life. She was now twenty-nine, and she realized with a start that this was the first time she had been seriously interested in any man but her husband. To Tsuruyoishi's Easy, carefree temperament somehow appealed to her, though she took great care not to let him guess that. A little later, Su Ruishi suggested taking Ryo and Ryokichi to see Asakusa on his next free day. They met in front of the information booth in Ueno Station, to Su Ruishi wearing an ancient gray suit that looked far too tight, Ryo clad in a blue dress of kimono material and a light brown coat. In spite of her cheap clothes, she had something about her, youthful and elegant, as she stood there in the crowded station. Beside the tall, heavy Tsuruyoshi, she looked like a schoolgirl off on a holiday. In her shopping bag, they had lunch, bread, oranges, and seaweed stuffed with rice. Well, let's hope it doesn't rain, said Tsuruyoshi, putting his arm lightly around Ryo's waist as he steered her through the crowd. They took the subway to Asakusa Station, then walked from the Matsuya department store to the Nitenshinto gate, past hundreds of tiny stalls. The Asakusa district was quite different from what Ryo had imagined. She was amazed. When Tsuruyoshi pointed to the small, red, lacquered temple, and told her that this was the home of the famous Asakusa goddess of mercy. In the distance she could hear the plaintive wail of a trumpet and a saxophone emerging from some loudspeaker. It mingled strangely with the sound of the wind whistling through the branches of the ancient sakaki trees. They made their way through the old clothes market and came to a row of food stalls squeezed tightly against each other beside the Asakusa pond. Here the air was redolent with the smell of burning oil, scented oil, lots of it. Tsuruyoshi went to one of the stalls and bought Ryokichi a stick of yellow candy floss. The boy nibbled at it as the three of them walked down a narrow street plastered with American-style billboards, advertising restaurants, movies, and rev- reviews. It was less than a month since Ryo had first noticed Tsuruishi by his cabin, and yet she felt as much at ease with him as if she had known him all her life. Well, it started raining after all, he said, holding out her, his hand. Ryo looked up to see the scattered drops of rain falling from the gray sky. So their precious excursion would be ruined, she thought. We better go in there, said Tsuruishi, pointing to one of the shops outside which hung a garish lantern with characters announcing the Merry Tea House. They took seats at a table underneath a ceiling decorated with artificial cherry blossoms. The place had a strange, unhomelike atmosphere, but they were determined to make the best of it and ordered a pot of tea. Rio d- distributed her stuffed seaweed, bread, and oranges. It was not long before the meal was finished, and by then it had started raining in earnest. We better wait till it lets up a bit, suggested Tsuruishi, then I'll take you home. Ria wondered if he was referring to her place or his. She was staying in the cramped apartment of a friend from her hometown, and did not even have a room to call her own. Rather than go there, she would have preferred returning to Tsuruishi's cabin, but that was too scarcely. That, too, was scarcely large enough to hold three people. Taking out her purse, she counted her money under the table. The 700 yen should be enough to get shelter for a few hours at an inn. Do you know what I'd really like, she said. I'd like us to go to a movie and then find some inn and have a dish of food before he's saying goodbye to each other. But I suppose that's all rather expensive. 
Yes, I suppose it is, said Tuzuruishi, laughing. Come on, we'll do it all the same. Taking his overcoat off the peg, he flew it over Ryukichi's head and ran through the downpour to a movie theater. Of course there were no seats. Standing, watching the film, a little boy went sound asleep, leaning against Tusuruishi. The air in the theater seemed to get thicker and hotter every moment. On the roof they could hear the rain beating down. It was getting darker as they left the theater and hurried through this rain, which pelted down with the swishing sound of banana leaves in a high wind. At last they found a small inn where the landlord led them to a carpeted room at the end of a drafty passage. Rio took off her wet socks. The boy sat in the corner and promptly went back to sleep. Here you can use this as a pillow, said Tuzuri, she picking up an old cushion from a chair and putting it under Ryukichi's head. From an overflowing gutter above the window, the water poured in a steady stream into the courtyard. It sounded like a waterfall in some faraway mountain village. Tusuruishi took out a handkerchief and began wiping Rio's wet hair. A feeling of happiness coursed through her as she looked up at him. It was as if the rain had begun to wash away all the loneliness, which had been gathering within her year after year. She went to see if they could get some food, and in the corridor met a maid in western clothes carrying a tea tray. After Rio had ordered two bowls of spaghetti, she and Tusuruishi sat down to drink their tea, facing each other across an empty brazier. Later, Tusuruishi came and sat on the floor beside Rio. Leaning their backs against the wall, they gazed out at the darkening, raining sky. How old are you, Rio? Tusuruishi asked her. I should guess twenty-five. Rio laughed. I'm afraid not, Tusuru. I'm already an old woman. I'm twenty-nine. Oh, so you're a year older than me. My goodness, you're young, said Rio. I thought you must be at least thirty. She looked straight at him into his dark, gentle eyes with their bushy brows. He seemed to be blushing slightly, and he bent forward and took off his wet socks. The rain continued unabated. Presently the maid came with some cold spaghetti and soup. Rio woke the boy and gave him a plate of soup. He was half asleep as he sipped it. Look, Rio, there's a ruse, she said. We might as well stay. I'll stay the night at this inn. You can't go home in this rain, can you? No, said Rio, I suppose not. Tuzuri, she left the room and returned with a load of quilted bedrolls, which she spread on the floor. Once the whole room seemed to be full of bedding, Rio tucked up her son in one of the rolls, the boy sleeping soundly as she did so. Then she turned out the light, undressed, and lay down. She could hear Tuzuri, she settling down at the other end of the room. I suppose the inn and the people in this inn think we're married, said Tuzuri, she after a while. Yes, I suppose so. It's not very nice of us to fool them. She spoke in jest, but now that she lay undressed in her bedroll, she felt for the first time vaguely disturbed and guilty. Her husband, for some reason, seemed much closer than he had for years. But, of course, she was only here because of the rain, she reminded herself. And gradually her thoughts began to wander pleasantly afield, and she dozed off. When she woke, it was still dark. She could hear Tusurui, she whispering her name from his corner. She sat up with a start. Rio, Rio, can I come and talk to you for a while? No, Tusuru, she said. I don't think you should. On the roof, the rain was still pattering down, but the force of the storm was over. Only a trickle was dropping from the gutter into the yard. Under the sound of the rain, she thought she could hear Tusuru. She sighed softly. Look, Tusuru, she said after a pause. I never asked you before, but are you married? No, not now, Tusuru, she said. You used to be? Yes, I used to be. When I got back from the army, I found that my wife was living with another man. Were you angry? Angry? Yes, I suppose I was. Still, there wasn't much I could do about it. She left me, and that was that. They were silent again. What shall we talk about, Rio asked. To Surui, she laughed. Well, there really doesn't seem to be anything special to talk about. That spaghetti wasn't very good, was it? No, one certainly couldn't call it good, and they charged us a hundred yen for it. It'd be nice if you and Ryukichi had your own room to live in, wouldn't it? Dusurui, she marked. Oh, yes, it would be marvelous. You don't think we might find a room near you? I'd really like to live near you, Dusuru, you know. It's pretty hard to find rooms these days, especially downtown, but I'll keep a lookout and let you know. You're such a wonderful person, Rio. <laughs> Me? said Rio, laughing. Don't be silly. 
yes, yes, you're wonderful, really wonderful. Real lay back on the floor. Suddenly she wanted to throw her arms around Tsuruishi to feel his body close to hers. She did not dare speak for fear that her voice might betray her. Her breath came almost painfully. Her whole body tingled. Outside the window, an early morning truck clattered past. Where are your parents, Tsuru? she asked after a while. In the country, near Fukuyuaku. But you have a sister in Tokyo? Yes, she's all alone like you, with two kids to take care of. She's got a sewing machine and makes Western-style clothes. Her husband was killed several years ago, in the war in China. War. Always. War. Outside the window, Ryo could make out the first glimmer of dawn. So their night together was almost over, she thought unhappily. In a way, she wished that Tuzurui she wouldn't, hadn't given up so easily. And yet, she was convinced that it was best like this. If he had been a man, she hardly knew, or for whom she felt nothing. She might have given herself to him with no afterthought. With Tsuruishi, it would have been different, quite different. Rio, I can't get to sleep, his voice reached her again. I'm wide awake, you know. I suppose I'm not used to this sort of thing. What sort of thing? By sleeping in the same room with a girl. Ugh, Tsuru, don't tell me you don't have girlfriends occasionally. Only professional girlfriends. Rio laughed. Men have it easy. In some ways, at least. She heard Tsuruishi moving about. Suddenly he was beside her, bending over her. Rio did not move, not even when she felt his arms around her, his face against hers, and the dark her eyes were wide open, and before them bright lights seemed to be flashing. His hot lips were pressed to her cheek. Rio, Rio, it's wrong, you know, she murmured, wrong to my husband. But almost at once she regretted the words. To Surui she bent over her, she could make out the silhouette of his face against the lightning sky. Bowing forward like that, he seemed to be offering obeisance to some god. That's like homage or respect. Rio hesitated for a moment, and then she threw her warm arms around his neck. Three. Two days later, Rio set out happily with her boy to visit to Suruishi. When she reached the bomb site, she was surprised not to see him before his cabin, his red kerchief tied about his head. Ryokichi ran ahead to find out if he were home and came back in a moment. There are strangers there, Mama. Seized with panic, Ryo hurried over to the cabin and peered in. Two workmen were busy piling up to Tsuruishi's effects in a corner. What is it, ma'am? One of them said, turning his head. I'm looking for Tsuruishi. Oh, don't you know? Tsuruishi died yesterday. Died, she said. She wanted to say something more, but no words would come. She had noticed a small candle burning on the shelf for family gods, but now she was aware of its somber meaning. Yes, said the man. He was killed at about eight o'clock last night. He went in a, in a truck with one of the men to deliver some iron bars in Omiya, and on their way back, the truck overturned on a narrow bridge. He and the driver were both killed. His sister went to Omiya today with one of the company officials to see about the cremation. Rio stared vacantly before her. Vacantly, she watched the two men piling up Tsuruishi's belongings. Beside the candle on the shelf, she caught sight of the two bags of tea he had bought from her that first day. Could it only be two weeks ago? One of them was folded over halfway down, the other still unopened. You were a friend of his, ma'am, I imagine. He was a fine fellow, Tsuru. Funny to think that he needn't have gone to Omiya at all. The driver wasn't feeling well, and Tsuru said he'd go along to Omiya to help him unload. Crazy, isn't it? After getting through the war and Siberia and all the rest of it to be killed like that? One of the men took down the postcard of the fifty bells of the Amada and blew the dust off of it. Rio, looking at Tsurishi's belongings piled on the floor, the kettle, the frying pan, the rubber boots. When her eyes reached the blackboard, she noticed for the first time a message scratched awkwardly in red chalk. Rio, I waited for you till two o'clock, back this evening. Automatically she bowed to the two men and hung the rucksack on her back. She felt numb as she left the cabin, holding Ryokichi by the hand, but as they passed the bomb site, the burning tears welled into her eyes. Did that man die, Mama? 
Yes, he died, Rio said. Why did he die? He fell into a river. The tears were running down her cheeks now. They poured out uncontrollably as she hurried through the downtown streets. They came to an arch bridge over the Sumida River, crossed it, and walked along the bank in the direction of Hakuhu. Don't worry if you get pregnant, was what she had told her after that morning in Asakusa. I'll look after whatever happens, Rio. And later on, just before they parted, he had said, I haven't much money, but you must let me help you out a bit. I can give you 2,000 yen a month out of my salary. He had taken Ryukichi to a shop that specialized in foreign goods and bought him a baseball cap with his name written on it, and then the three of them had walked gaily through the streetcar lines, squirting the enormous puddles left by the rain. When they came to a milk bar, Tusuruishi had taken them in and ordered them each a big glass of milk. Now an icy wind seemed to have blown up from a dark river. A flock of waterfowl stood on the opposite bank, looking frozen and miserable. Barges moved slowly up and down the river. Mom, I want a sketchbook. You said I could have a sketchbook. Later, answered Rio. I'll get you one later. But, Mama, we just passed a stall with hundreds of sketchbooks. I'm hungry, Mama. Can't we have something to eat? Later, a little later. They were passing a long row of bar barrack-like buildings. They must be private houses, she thought. The people who lived there probably all had rooms of their own. From one of the windows, a bedroll had been hung out to air, and inside a woman could be seen tidying the room. Tea for sale, called out Rio softly. Best quality, she's a yoko tea. There was no reply, and Rio repeated her call a little louder. I don't want any, said the woman. She pulled in the bedroll and shut the window with a bang. Rio went from house to house down the row, calling her where, but nobody wanted any tea. Ryokichi followed behind, muttering. But he was hungry and tired. Rio's rucksack cut painfully into her shoulders, and occasionally she had to stop to adjust the straps. Yet in a way, she almost welcomed the physical pain. 4. The next day, she went downtown to her, by herself, leaving Ryokichi at home. When she came to the bomb site, she noticed that a fire was burning inside the cabin. She ran to the door and walked in. By Tusurui, she still sat an old man in a short workman's overcoat, feeding the flames of the firewood. The room was full of smoke, and it billowed out of the window. What do you want? said the old man, looking around. I've come to sell some Shizuyoko tea. Shizuyoko tea? I got plenty of good tea right here. Rio turned without a word and hurried off. She had thought of asking for the address of Tsurishi's sister and of going to burn a stick of incense in his memory, but suddenly this seemed quite pointless. She walked back to the river, which reflected the late afternoon sun, and sat down by a pile of broken concrete. The body of a dead kitten was lying upside down a few yards away. As her thoughts went to Tsurishi, she wondered vaguely whether it would have been better never to have met him. No. No, certainly not that. She could never regret knowing him, nor anything that had happened with him, nor did she regret having come to Tokyo. When she arrived a month or so before, she had planned to return to the country if her business was unsuccessful. But now she knew she would be staying on here in Tokyo. Yes, probably right here in downtown Tokyo or Tsurui she had lived. She got up, swung the rucksack on her back, and walked away from the river. As she strolled along side a side street, she noticed a hut, which seemed to consist of old boards nailed haphazardly together. Going to the door, she called out, Tea for sale. Would anyone like some tea? The door opened, and in the entrance appeared a woman dressed far more poorly than Rio herself. How much does it cost? asked the woman. And then seeing the rucksack, she added, Come in. Rest a while, if you like. I'll see how much money we've got left. We may have some for tea. Rio went in and put down her rucksack. In the small room, four sewing women were sitting on the floor around an oil stove, working on a mass of shirts and socks. They were women like herself, thought Rio, as she watched their busy needles moving in and out of the material. The feeling of warmth came over her. So what do you think this teaches us about humanity? What does it teach us about 
Who is kindest? Who is willing to care? Who will open their doors to lonely strangers and hearts and friendships? What does it teach us about the poor people versus the wealthy people? What does it teach us about loneliness? Consider all of those possibilities and write one, one lesson you learned about one of those topics out in your notebook. I hope you enjoyed Tokyo.